Which movement, of course, famously kicks off with the Seneca Falls Convention in uh, 1848, and you know the, the and and what you have there is a gathering of highly educated uh, uh, activist women who don't have the right to vote, and there's no right to vote in the Constitution uh, at that time. And these people are saying that they're going to do what they can, and it takes them from 1848 until 1920. I know you don't think about it from today's point of view, but in fact, it's almost harder conceptually for the women to get the right to vote than for black people. Because if you can cast your mind back and you know about history, in 1848, in the 1800s, the idea that men and women were equal was because men and women were simply not the same. And there, the view was there were all kinds of pseudo-scientific theories about women's brain and their passion, and they have periods so they can't, you know, do this and that. And it was, you know, embedded in the society. And so you had a real separation. It was almost like the official doctrine. It's called the cult of domesticity. Women took care of the home, and men were out in public. So changing that is extraordinarily difficult. So you may wonder, how does it change? If you look at a map that shows voting rights for women in the United States, you'll notice that the states, and remember again, it's states. States can give women the right to vote. All of the early women's suffrage states are in the West. The first one is Wyoming. You know, if you look at a Wyoming coin, it says the equality state, right? Um, of course, Wyoming Territory came in with a constitution in 1869 that gave the women full right to vote. Now, until they were a state in 1890, they couldn't vote for president, but still, this is the first place. Wyoming, so why would Wyoming be interested in doing this? Today, it's probably the most conservative state in the, in the country, right? Who's out in Wyoming? You know, it's men. Men from the East, miners, lumberjacks, uh, you know, explorers, fur traders. And when they want to settle down and have what is considered normal civilized life, they need wives, right? Now, wh who's available is Native Americans and dance hall girls, but they want. And so they offer an incentive to women in the East. If you come here, you can vote, but it isn't only they're offering them only voting. It's also full property vote, uh, property rights. Women can own property in the Western states independent of their husbands. And this is a big, big issue in much of, you know, women's history, as you're aware of this, right? When women got married, they gave up their property rights to their husbands back east, not in the West. So you'll see the first four states to come in are Wyoming, with women's suffrage, are Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho. Really kind of obscure places attracting women, just parenthetically, because I'm obsessed with details. In Utah, it was slightly different. Mormon state, uh, Mormon women don't have equal rights with Mormon men here on earth. But the Mormons realized that if they had their wives vote, it would double their vote and they could outvote the Gentiles and take over the state of Utah for the Mormons. So that was a slight exception. And this continues so that by the time of, of World War I, right, there's only uh, all of the states with women's suffrage, 14 of them, are all west of the Mississippi. And the only one east of the Mississippi is Illinois, but Illinois only allows women to vote in presidential elections, but none of the local, or what a weird sort of thing like this, but it's state by state. And this is why you need um, the constitutional amendment. I love Supreme Court cases, but let me give you a really interesting one before I don't run out of time. In 1874, a woman, uh, Virginia Minor in uh, Missouri, sued for the right to vote under the 14th Amendment saying that the Equal Protection Clause allowed her to, to vote, and she took it to the Supreme Court, and they struck her down. They said, simply, there's just nothing in the 14th or 15th Amendment to give women the right to vote. Now, a, 
the last thing I'd like to say on this, because I don't know how much time I have, I think about one minute, is that you might be curious because the, all the votes to allow women to vote were done by men. So why would men be interested in this? Part of it, as we could see, was alluring women out to the West by giving them additional votes. But back in the East, what's the question? Is it just a matter of justice? If it was just that, you'd be living in a different world than you do. So people aren't motivated that much just by justice. But one of the big beliefs at the turn of the 20th century was that women were morally superior to men. And during the progressive era, the first couple decades of the 20th century, the belief was that if you allowed women to vote, it would improve the politics of the United States. And you can see in the progressive era, you get the progressive income tax, uh, you get prohibition, you get direct election of senators, and the women's right to vote. So there is some evidence of this, but I do want to say this, and this applies, you know, why didn't Hillary Clinton win? Because white women didn't vote for her. In 1920, the first election that women were allowed to vote, 36% of eligible women went out and voted, 36%. And in fact, exit studies, they weren't as good as they were today. They virtually all voted the way their husbands did. You don't get what we call gender gap until the 1970s during the women's rights movement that I remember very well. So anyway, that's um, sort of my take on that. How's my time? Thank you. Yeah, you are actually good on time. You, you, you went right through it. So thank you. Okay. I did have a question, though, um, about the women's movement and the suffrage movement. So I always find this topic very uh, peculiar because during the women's movement, a lot of people don't know that the black women and the white women actually separated and had their own movement. Um, can you talk about that separation and like in the different values that each group had? I, I tell you, one of the s s saddest things is um, that most of those white women, educated women were, were at the head of the abolitionist movement. And they had worked so hard, hand in glove with both black and uh, bl uh, women and black men abolitionists. And one of the, the saddest thing is the falling out uh, between Susan B. Anthony and, and Frederick Douglass, who are neighbors of each other, close, live close by in Rochester, New York during that time. So the assumption was that once the black men got the right to vote, that they would be helping the white women to get the right to vote. But, you know, there's the famous exchange between Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass, and she says, aren't you going to help us? And Douglass says, look, I got my hands full just trying to get, you know, white, white, uh, uh, get black men the right to vote. And of course, there is animosity, and those well-educated white women are saying, what are you kidding me? Some black guy who's all been picking cotton and doesn't know what the world is like, you know, beyond six miles from his plantation, has the right to vote. He can't read, and we can't. And so that kind of stuff really stuck in there. And in terms of, you know, there were the historically black colleges, there were plenty of, no. Uh, you know, black educated women. Um, there was a woman who just just died who was the first, it was in the paper. I mean, it all got kind of buried now with John Lewis, but a black woman who was the first uh, doctor to get uh, um, her medical degree from one of the historically black colleges just died two days ago. I, I don't remember her name, I'm sorry. But um, there's still, you know, a push there you know, the white women and the black women don't, they're not in the same social circles. Now you do see pictures, like if you're watching the PBS special that was on earlier this week, the four hour thing uh, called The Boat, you do see plenty of, of pictures of uh, uh, integrated uh, women's movement. But, uh, you know, it's hard. People live in, people are in different social circles. You know, I mean, you know, we had this discussion the other uh, other night. Um, if if I and you know this thing about 
and we were talking about white fragility, the book, and she points out that you know, a good many white liberal people live in, it's not de facto, it's, I mean, not de jure, but de facto segregated communities, right? And, you know, maybe if they go into Boston or, or you know, they're in some organization or something, they might, but they're, you know, they're common experiences, not with people of other races, colors, and this sort of thing. That's not their common experience. I mean, you know, I mentioned I was from Staten Island, and it's a kind of notoriously nowhere, but not in terms of race matters, it's a really bad place. And so I know a lot about this. And I grew up in a place where, you know, I mean, it was New York City, but I, I lived as segregated as anybody in, you know, any part of the South. And uh, so, you know, I, I think that's the thing. But I, I, I do, you know, when you read that story about Douglas and Susan B. Anthony, it really brings tears to your eyes because I, 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 it was so intense. Anyway, that's sort of my... You know, <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, that was some great insight. That's going to lead up to what Willie's going to talk about. So now we're going to move forward. We have now actually gotten the right to vote, but we hit Jim Crow era in the, in the Jim Crow South, which um, uses intimidation to prevent Blacks and um, others to, to vote. So Willie, can you talk about the Jim Crow era and the voter intimidation tactics that were used down South? Um, first, we want to now. Steve highlighted some of the things that we talked about, but uh, I do want to go back to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. So the 13th Amendment literally freed the slaves, uh, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, where, um, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to its jurisdiction. Now, this is a critical piece of information because uh, if you've read the new Jim Crow, so what, what happens is most people disconnect this little, this little foundation in law with the 13th Amendment. So you have African Americans who've been new freely, they've just been released from slavery, they've been freed, but because of the 13th Amendment, some of the southern states now remember they were they were they were part of the confederacy so now they have to re-enter the union and so the 13th amendment what they do is they get around that by by incarcerating african american males so you know this is the beginning of the legal technicality in terms of the chain gain and so forth so that was passed uh, that's the 13th amendment december 18th 1865 so that's why when people talk about slavery, they're not, they're not listening and not making the connection like Steve mentioned in terms of the constitution. So, you know, the, the leftover is, and, and if, if you haven't read the new Jim Crow, it's critical, but this is where it goes back in terms of how African-Americans are treated differently than white people. And it's coded and it's encased in legal law. So that's the 13th Amendment. Then the 14th Amendment, which was July 28th, 1868, uh, it, 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 uh, it goes on to say, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state where they provide. But this is critical, and I'm glad that Steve alluded to it. Uh, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges of immunities of the citizens of the United States. Okay, so what happens is because the Constitution didn't specifically say you have the right to vote. So when it was written, it was, as, as Steve alluded to so clearly, the, the document, you know, pursuit of every, all men are created equal, they were only talking about white property men. Native Americans didn't have the right to vote. They were here first. They didn't get the right to vote till 1924, uh, four years after women got the right to vote. So, so, so even though it was written in the Declaration of Independence, there was really no commitment to make it real for everybody. And so, so that's the 14th Amendment. Then we come to the 
the, the 15th Amendment, that's March 30th, 1870, and the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And again, Steve was very right on, on track. So what that did, now the Southern states, they wanna come back into the union and they're saying, oh my goodness, we've got all these freed African-Americans. So now there's no slavery. So now they create what we call the Jim Crow laws, you know, and that's, that's essentially what happened. Now, I'm glad that Jim mentioned, uh, he mentioned the suffragette, a uh, suffragist movement and, and Blanche Ames, who was an outstanding vocal local suffragist in the town of Northeastern. And what she did, she fought here in Massachusetts, her and her husband, he was a, a president of the uh, men's uh, right to vote for women, the local chapter. And, and, and as a result, you know, they, you know, she was successful. Once the, the vote was done, she moved on to another concern of hers, which was birth control. And, uh, but what happens is, and people forget this all the time, women got the right to vote in 1920, but that discounted all the black women in the South because of Jim Crow laws and their husbands who couldn't vote. So there was already voter intimidation. So other parts of the country, we, you know, the African-Americans here in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and California, Arizona, they still had it, but they still had their own Jim Crow laws, but they weren't as restrictive. So this is very, very critical. And so when people say, oh, but slavery is over, you know, um, but they don't realize that it's not just slavery, but the legal. And that's what Steve highlighted, which is so important. And so uh, the Southern states went about creating these legal, these legal uh, things. And they said, oh, no, 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 it's not against color. And then so the Jim Crow laws actually spoke across the board, it, but it was legal. It was encased. And so it did restrict the, uh, the rights of African-Americans from voting. Uh, in Florida, we have no schools for white children and schools for Negro children shall be conducted, uh, shall be conducted uh, together. They have to be separate. And then there's intermarriage Arizona, the marriage of a person of Caucasian blood with a Negro, Mongolian, Malay, or Hindu shall be null and void, Arizona. So what they did was, just to make sure they can say that, oh, and we're not speaking against black, they would add on different ethnic groups. That's a good example. Uh, this is from Georgia. Uh, the officer, in, the, it re relates to burial. The officer in charge shall not bury or allow to be buried any colored persons upon ground set apart or used for the burial of white persons. And that's why you have to explain to young students why the, the, the cemeteries are segregated, even in the city of Chicago, okay? So then, and then reform schools, this is in Kentucky. The children of white and colored races committed to houses of reform shall be kept entirely separate from each other. So we have a system in place, institutionalized, and that's why when we talk about systemic racism, and so those laws were coded. So the federal government, what, what, uh, what, what Steve alluded to earlier, that panic of 1873, basically we had a Civil Rights Act of 1865. 1865. We, if, if, if the federal government had had the moxie to continue, we wouldn't have had to wait 100 years to 1960s for the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of, of 1964 and 1965. So what happened was the radical Republicans got tired and, and it was economics and they wanted to move on and they felt, well, we freed the slaves, but they didn't guarantee the rights. So we have all of these in place. And, and so we have, and it takes a, it takes a legal and economic uh, toll. For example, this one from Oklahoma, uh, telephone booths. The Corporation Commission is hereby vested with power and authority to require telephone companies to maintain separate booths for white and colored patrons 
where there is a demand for such separate roofs. That co the Corporation Commission shall determine the necessity for said separate roofs upon only complaint of the people in the town of vicinity to be served after due hearing as now provided by law in other complaints filed with the Corporation uh, Commission. And, and of course, we know about the, the horrible, the most, most uh, outrageous, destructive racial riot in U.S. history, 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Greenwood section, where they were forced by segregation to create their own communities. And they were so successful. It was like a, it was like a, 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 a Midwest version of, of Harlem you know, a renaissance with black businesses and, and so forth, and it was destroyed. Uh, 300 people were killed and so forth. So the, the community was just angered to see this, you know. So you have these history, the history encoded in terms of the Jim Crow law. Now, after, and this is another point that I want to uh, uh, talk about, people don't realize, because uh, somebody had said to me, gee, I don't understand. You know, it's just a monument of a, of, a, of a Southern general. How does that, you know, and, and what we do is we have a period in the, and uh, all those statues, you know, people don't understand, even though they were built after, after the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, and they were intended to intimidate. So the Southern communities were saying, you might be free and Washington might say you're free, but you're our boy or you're our girl. So the statues were a reminder, along with the flags, that we're in control and you will do what I say. So it was a reinforcement of the Jim Crow era. So we have those statues being built in the 1890s and then the, uh, several. And then we have another group of them built in the 1920s. And then we have even more built in the 1970s. So. All this is intimidation, and that's where we are today, which is wonderful, Jessica, when you, you have your second next week, the, the second in terms of voter suppression. So this is a history, a history. All the work that uh, the late John Lewis and others, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, C.T. Vivian, who was a good friend of Dr. King and, uh, and, and a good writer too as well, uh, that, who recently passed. But what's happened is, why should African Americans every few years go before Congress and say, please renew the Voter Registration Act? What kind of attitude is that when whites already have it? They don't have to ask every five or 10 years, please, can we have a, 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 a reassessment and can we continue with the Voting Act? So you can see the systemic racism. That's what people are dealing with. And uh, a friend of mine recently, she said to me, she said, uh, one person had said, oh, I'm so tired of hearing about racism. And she said, I'm, and I'm tired of being the victim, you know? And so people, you know, even though the person was complaining, she was white, how would you like to be the victim? You know, so people are fed up. And a lot of times we feel, you know, people of color, this is the moment. So as I continue, I want, the, it's so important for our participants uh, of all 29 of you to listen to what Steve has said, to listen to what I have said, and then chime in. And because it's together, working together, that we could make a better Brockton, a better Quincy, a better Randolph. Because uh, I want to stress the NAACP, it's the Brockton area. So as some of you know, there have been activities in West Bridgewater, East Bridgewater, where the NAACP has been involved. So I don't want people to think that that the NAACP is just a Brockton institution. It's an area-wide institution that's for the good of all citizens. And, and what people fail to understand is, as a teacher, as a professor, it, whatever, when I was asked by a special ed teacher, oh, Mr. Wilson, can you modify this for a special ed teacher? And I did the modification. You know, it benefited all of my students, you know. And so when you raise up, the least in any given community, you're raising up the caliber of the community in general. And so that's very, very, very important. And I, I do want to mention, because Steve touched upon it, uh, it when we talk about suffrage, suffrage 
and suffragettes, you know. So, and, uh, and Courtney, you asked Steve to elaborate. Uh, I am a scholar for the uh, Brockton suffrage program at the Brockton Public Library, but we have thousands of women of color who were neglected. And as you said, Steve, they was, there was segregation. There was segregation. And a lot of the women, that's why we had the women's club movement. So Josephine St. Pierre Refford, uh, Mary Church Terrell, Mary Ann Shad, uh, Mary Ann Shad. We have Adela Hunt Logan, Fanny Jackson Coffin, uh, Helen uh, Apple Cook, Nanny Helen Burroughs, uh, Fanny Barrier Williams, Margaret Murray Washington, Ida B. Wells. We have scores of, of suffragists who were African American, who were dynamos in their community, not to mention hundreds of others right from here from the Brockton area whose names have never been recorded in history. So that's been our focus with that, that project. But uh, let me see, I, I still have a few more minutes. I want to use up my time economically like Steve did. Uh, and, and so what I want to bring to the table for our discussion and for our participants is that this whole project that has uh, been sponsored by the NAACP and uh, Lambda Kappa Sigma Chata, Chapa is to get young people involved, to get people to vote, no matter who you want to. And the NAACP has been consistent with this. Please vote, please get involved. And uh, I do want to mention a couple of other things. I think uh, I still have a few more minutes. Uh, the, the, the fact, what, what uh, Steve mentioned about when he talked about the women who got the right to vote in the West, those pioneer women, and we had African-American women among that group, you know, like they, and they had the right to vote and so forth, and that's why they led it. But World War I, all those African-American soldiers, when they came home, they came home, they said, you know, it's segregated, we were fighting for democracy, and some of them were lynched in their Southern communities because the, the local authorities felt they were too uppity, and so we have these waves of migration, you know, uh, three major waves of migration from the South to the North. And so it changes the, the complexion of many of our Northern cities. Uh, and Steve mentioned, and that's an accurate uh, uh, factor he used, 1920, only 36% of the women came out to vote. And as historians, we don't know all the reasons why, but it's a tragic situation. Now, currently, the white suburban female vote in this country is a critical vote in terms of the next election. And if, if, uh, if you watch the news, that's the vote that, that President Trump is really trying to win. And, and one of the reasons why he wanted to reopen all the schools nationwide was some, some, some of the pundits, pundits have told him this is the vote to get. And he thought by opening all the schools that he would get that white female suburb, suburban vote. But what he failed to realize is no one wants to open a school district when he has failed in terms of, of, of addressing the COVID-19 issue. And so it, all these things we're talking about go back to history. You can trace them. You can trace them from the 1860s, the 1920s, the 1890s, and so forth. And they all have a thread that connect to our current situation. And I think I hit every single point that I wanted. And with that, I'll rest my case. Um, Steve, did you, what, did you have something to say? Yeah, I just, I'm muted. Also, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Also, my head got big. I don't know if you control that. I was smaller, but anyway. Um, I, for, I don't know how many of you, maybe all of you have seen um, a Netflix film called 13th. Right. Excellent. Okay. Yep. If you've uh, seen it, if you haven't seen it, it's Ava DeBorne. Uh She did Selma. Um, you should see it. If you've seen it already, you should watch it again. And if you've seen it twice, you should watch it a third time. But one of the points that it makes, it's the beginning of sort of mass incarceration of African Americans. At the end of the Civil War, when all the black people are free, 
What are they going to do? This is a big issue. Where are they going to go? So being free might meant that maybe you could just leave your plantation, just walk somewhere else. They, the Southern power brokers can't have that. So they pass vagrancy laws. If you are not working, it's a crime and it's a felony. So you know, even today in uh, the Supreme Court Justice Week, you know, uh, verified, uh, except if you continue to accept Florida's law, which is um, 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 taking away the right to vote from convicted felons, even when they're done in the Florida case. So the fact is that they, that once a person was like Willie's pointing out the 13th Amendment, once they committed a crime, which was vagrancy, not agreeing to work for lousy wages, of course, um, then they were, they were criminalized and they lose their rights. And so that's a really interesting. And this continues to this day. You're probably aware in 2013, this is when Obama was president, the Supreme Court struck down the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and said that the Justice Department is no longer allowed to send monitors into the South. And, and that's today. Right. And, and John Roberts, uh, uh, jo uh, Justice John Paul Stevens, wrote the opinion, and he said that the, the complaints were based on uh, past history and that, that the reason they had those monitors was because stuff that was happening in 1965, and he said that's in the past. And he, and he struck down the Voting Rights Act, and now the states are allowed to run free. In Georgia, their technique is to just simply purge the voter rolls, and these are legal because the Supreme Court, so <laughs> this is like nowhere over. So you tell your friends, and if, if, if Trump gets reelected or the Senate remains in the hands of the Republicans, you can see this keep happening, you know? And, and, and I, I'm glad you brought that up, and, and I know, Courtney, you're going to their questions from our viewers, uh, but that's why there's a need for federal protection. See, the federal government failed they failed after during Reconstruction, and they failed after the Civil Rights Movement because they didn't encase and enshrine those freedoms. And so you can't leave it up in terms of the freedom of right to vote. You can't leave it up to the individual states, you know, because some states will do well and others won't, and particularly the South. And then, and and and, and what people don't also understand is the psychological uh, uh, well-being of people of color in the South, you know. And this is one of the, the tenets. There was such a disagreement between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois and the Talented Tent. And, and both of them were on the same page. But what W.E.B. Du Bois failed to realize, and he lived in Atlanta, is that Booker T. Washington was 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 confronted every day with the possibility of, of black and tan people being lynched. And so, you know, W.E. E. Du Bois was thinking more of Chicago and New York and the talented tent. But, you know, Booker T. Washington was interested in people living, being able to live without that daily threat. And so one of the things that he said, Booker T. Washington said, in all things economic, we can be as tight as the fist, but in all things social, we can be as separate as the fingers. So the, the point is, he, you know, that idea of the separation, he went along with it because that was a political reality in terms of Jim Crow. So he cooperated with it. And the, the two of them really weren't far apart. But all those things contribute to the current malaise in terms of what is happening now. And some of my former uh, uh, students of uh, police officers, in fact, one of my, the, the former chief uh, Crowley, he was one of my students at Brockton High. But a lot of, uh, a lot of them, and I've spoken to them, and uh, it started a couple of years ago with all the killings of young black uh, uh, men out west, and then of course, New York City, and this whole issue. And I said, what is it, uh, why haven't we here in Massachusetts experienced some of these things, you know, that's happening nationwide. 
and all of them said, Mr. Wilson, it's the, it's the training. That's, and I, earlier this afternoon, I was, uh, had a conversation with uh, Senator Brady, and it was all about this new police bill and so forth, but it's the training, but also, it, you know, what, that's a difference, but it's more in terms of people being valued. And I have to say, with, with George Floyd, it, even if that was a dog that that policeman had his knee on, it, it still would have been horrible. But to have a human being say, I can't breathe 20 times and then be murdered on public TV in terms of the, the footage. So that's where we are today, the right to vote. Everybody has to participate, black, white, tan, brown, yellow, to make a better America and a better Brockton. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Thank you, Steve. Um, great insight. I know we, we were talking about a lot. And I, as, as I was listening to you guys speak, I just looked over at my desk and realized that I had uh, this book, Slavery by Another Name, which actually touched on vagrancy laws, um, which you know, and they used to take away the vote for Black men. And then I know we mentioned a lot about the, the Jim Crow um, by Michelle Alexander, also a great book. She's also in the 13th documentary that Steve had mentioned on Netflix. I actually watched it um, last month. So I, I, I encourage um, everyone to watch it as Steve has um, suggested. Um, I actually have both books too, Slavery by Another Name. It was a documentary series is how I yeah. first found out about it. Yeah. And then the book, I will not lie, I'm still getting through the book, but I watched a documentary um, and I will definitely check out the one that Steve mentioned as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're awesome books. I remember reading them in undergrad. Um, I also, where John Lewis actually went, he went to Fisk and graduated. So he's a Fiskite like myself. Um, so we actually have a few questions. I know we started, we ended up just a little bit early, but I think that we, we're okay to go ahead and go into the questions. Um, just because I, I did look at some and they are really great questions. Um, Let's see, one from Alvin. He um, wrote, um, was Ida B. Wells a uh, big part of the movement and were there tension um, between allowing Black women to be a part? Uh, I'm going to assume that that's a part of the movement. So um, was Ida B. Wells a big part of the movement um, with voting? Uh, I, I, yeah, I'll take that and then Steve can chime in. Uh, Ida B. Wells was a very powerful uh, part of the movement uh, from Memphis, Tennessee, and she started out as a journalist and, and, you know, as a young person, she did not, you know, the, uh, it's, it, the lynching thing, she never really believed. She said, well, maybe, you know, in her own mind, she thought, well, maybe that person did something wrong. It's still wrong for them to be lynched, but they should be guaranteed. And it, it hit home when a good friend of hers who was an upstanding citizen was lynched. And then that kind of launched her, her anger and her passion, you know. And, uh, and she did participate in the movement, but they were still discriminated against. And I do want to say Mary Church Terrell, she established the National Organization for University of Women, University of Women, Colored Women. And she, uh, again, all of these people, very articulate. And one of the differences between Black suffragists and white suffragists, if you look and examine the literature, is that uh, the black suffragists were interested in a, a lot of social, changing some of the social issues that confronted black men. So if you look at, at the writings, you'll see that they, they were very specific. But I have to say too, what Steve said, it was very tragic, very, very tragic in terms of the split between Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony and others. And uh, because he was the, at one point, the only man, you know, 1848, 1850. He, in fact, when they had the women's convention in Worcester, you know, he was there. And it's so tragic, be, but he said, we have to have uh, the, the male suffrage first in terms of the former slave. But even after that happened, he didn't anticipate the, the vitriol in the way the Southerners the legal system could entangle to literally rob the black man of his vote. So he was still involved in that right up until he died in 1895. But Ida B. Well, and, and he were, they were on the same page and she's a great, great American. And uh, there's just a lot of information about her. Yep. Steve, anything to add? 
Um, no, uh, not about about that that topic there. I would, um, you know, there was the mention of the Tulsa thing, and you know, the, the question might be, and, and you know, Greenwood and the Black Wall Street and all that, an extraordinary place. Why were there black people in Oklahoma? Is a, is an interesting question. And um, you know, Oklahoma was not a state till 1907, so black people were better uh, welcomed in Indian territory uh, after the American Civil War than they were in in other white, you know, dominated Western places. And um, it's not till the eight, uh, late 1880s that white people start moving into Oklahoma. They were, you know, they were restricted. They couldn't move into Oklahoma until 1889. And then there was a huge, you know, the, the, you'd see Oklahoma University, the boomers and the Sooners pouring into Oklahoma. And that transforms Oklahoma into, you know, the equivalent of a Confederate state, right. uh, a really extremely racist place. But it's interesting that at first, the, the Indians, and, and it's funny, even in colonial New England, this is sort of off the topic, but um, uh, Indians and um, uh, freed black men uh, got on really well. And I was doing this, this study in this program down at Yale, and this guy, John Demos, who does these colonial Indian things and colonists, but anyway, um, uh, Indian women were interested in marrying black men because they were more likely to do hard work than uh, Indian men, right? Because they had, you know, done actual work and they were much better husbands. It's just a kind of a funny thing because um, if you see, I mean, just see Indians in New England, they're obviously multiracial people. You know, not like if you're in. Well, I'm Dakota. glad you mentioned that point because uh, that's another uh, misnomer in terms of the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad actually started with African Americans running away into Indian lands in the yeah. South, where the Native Americans welcomed them in, and uh, and and initially the 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 white plantation owners wouldn't go that far. So that was the beginning. Later on, it's co-opted by Quakers and others, but that's the beginning of the Underground Railroad because the Native Americans welcomed it. And also here in Massachusetts, we had uh, Plymouth Bay and we had Mass Bay colonies. And of course, they merged to form the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But Mashpee Indians, that was one of the issues when they went to uh, grant the, the federal uh, distinction in terms of marriage, because there was so much intermarriage between the Mashpee Indians and the former free slaves that the government, the opposing argument was, well, you're not really Native American because you've got so much African American intermixture, you know. And even today, like when people look at me, they don't see the Mohawk Indian. They don't see the Irish ancestry. They just see African American, you know. But and so a lot of African Americans that's why we're complex and and race is a social construct. People need to be aware of that. What since everybody was bringing up books, I did want to mention Be the Bridge by Latasha Morrison, which is outstanding. Um and and it it just does a a, a lot in terms of you know, to help people, particularly when we talk about right, white fragility and so forth, for white people to understand what is happening and and why why hadn't they been aware that this was happening all along? And, you know, I have five children and they've all had the time. I have three young adult men and, 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 and twin women. And who, the twins are 25. They're the youngest. And, you know, you have to have this talk and you explain... And even though we're in Massachusetts, which is very liberal and it's not the same, but I have relatives in the South and people know you can go a few miles outside of Atlanta and you're in a place where you really gotta be careful. So it's here it is the 21st century 
and we're still dealing with these issues. So uh, I digress like Steve. So Courtney, go on with your questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the next one reads, is there evidence that voter intimidation was used against women after the 19th Amendment was passed by Sharon? Well, um, <laughs> this is another one of these Supreme Court cases that I'm, I'm obsessed with. There, um, until 1922, women's uh, citizenship, their nationality depended on the man that they were married to. So there is a Supreme Court case involving a woman in California who actually married a Scottish this is after California had women's suffrage, a Scottish man, and lost her right to vote because she lost her citizenship right. So there are, you know, there's that. There were some legal impediments. Uh, that's been changed by law. Um, and, and also, the longest time, I mean, one of the things that happened, I think, up to the women's movement was it's not ladylike to vote. Your husband can represent you, um, that this is a mannish thing to do. I mean, I remember when I was a little boy, women wearing pants, you know, pants suits or kind of thing like that for, for leisure was considered unladylike in the 50s. And, and um, I mean, I remember a specific incident. My mother was riding a bicycle with pants on and there were people commenting. So this question of how to properly be a woman. Now that doesn't plague us today so much, at least in the United States, but that was for the longest time after the women's right to vote, a real legitimate social issue, even if it wasn't a legal impediment. Yeah. I, I, you know, there's something you just said that triggered the, uh, when it, by the, one of my interviews, when I interviewed a senior, uh, uh, teachers and women told me, you know, of course, once you got married, you lost your job. But they, the uh, some of the elderly uh, teachers that I interviewed, they said they could not. You could not. Now, men could after teaching during the week, they could go and and have a drink at the, at any bar. But as a woman, um, if you were seen at an establishment or you were having a drink, you and it was reported on a weekend, you could be fired summarily that Monday morning. And so, uh, and I, and I, and I couldn't believe it. And I asked my guidance counselor at the time, uh, uh, Mrs. McEachran, and she, and she validated that. And, uh, and she lived into her, her 90s. But it's just, you know, these are some of the things that even though with the vote, that's why the vote wasn't even the the twentieth the nineteenth amendment is not enough. You really need the equal rights amendment, which we still don't have. You know, so like you know, what happens is we have this history of uh, bits and parcels being distributed to women or minorities, but never the full fruit. You know, you know, because the 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 limb keeps going up. So the the equality is not there. The equality is not there. And uh, and so that's where the issue has to be. And the Equal Rights Amendment would actually deal with that in terms of equal work, equal pay. Yeah, um, you know, that was called morals clauses that were in women's uh, public. If they were public employees, they had a morals clause in their contract. Um, the thing about the Equal Rights Amendment, which, you know, uh, Willie and I remember in, twice it passed Congress. Now, it had to have two-thirds votes in both houses of Congress, so it had to be a strongly bipartisan support, but neither time did it get the three-quarters of the states, and there's a, there's a film that's on, like, Netflix or Amazon now about Phyllis Sh Sh Schlafly, who led the anti-women's movement, uh, anti- a women amendments movement and I think Kate Blanchett plays her um, and I haven't seen it I, I almost can't watch it because it's so bad but um, th you know this sort of thing so women you know you can hear this kind of argument do women 
um, subvert their own interests. Sometimes you hear stories, my wife will tell me or other women, that women pull other women down, like at work from climbing the ladder and stuff. And, and this is the explanation for Hillary Clinton. You had, I mean, you had a highly qualified, intelligent woman who, you know, maybe had some personality flaws, but she was extraordinarily qualified to be president of the United States. And after all this time, right, 52% of the white women, the largest voting bloc in Indian, 52% of them vote for Donald Trump. And he's a gargoyle. Every woman you know you talk to will tell you about incidents of sexual harassment at work, right? Such large numbers of women will tell you about either really violent or at least slightly uh, bad encounters for sexual, uh, you know, physical sexual harassment. Uh, women will talk about just the way men talk about women, the quote, locker room talk. And yet, Donald Trump, who's the living embodiment of every, you know, that phrase, men are pigs, 52% of white women go and vote for him. Now, there's reasons for this that, that are almost embarrassing to talk about, but that's a truth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this question about, you know, women president, that was the closest we're going to get for a long time. I, I okay. just want to mention, I want to go back to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the Greenwood yeah. section. And, and, you know, we talked about Black Wall Street. And here's the tragedy. All that, you are right, we, 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 we didn't talk about it, but after after slavery, we had some successful programs under the Freedmen's Bureau in Georgia and in South Carolina, where freed slaves were trained and they took over former pres uh, plantations and and they were uh, uh, doing work, and and there was that forty acres and a mule. But it's so ironic that in Oklahoma. Where and, and Alex Haley grew up in Oklahoma, his grandmother, and uh, and those of those those of you who are familiar with roots, but that was Native American territory, and and when that when the uh, riot occurred in 1921, you know the Native Americans on those reservations didn't even have the right to vote. They got the right to vote in 1924, three years after Tulsa, and it's just. You look at these ironies and inconsistencies, and it's just, you know, that's why when people say, boy, how come I didn't learn this in, in, in school? You know, because the history is so grappling, it's so painful, you know, when you tell the truth that, uh, you know, you, you really need to do it in a way that's compassionate. I, um, Willie was, and people were doing book recommendations. I'd like to just do a tiny bit here. Um, you might have read Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad, but the second book, Nickel Boys, which I like better. Um, oh, no, I haven't read that. Yeah, yeah it's it, out in paperback. What's that called, Nickel Boys? Nickel Boys. It's, yeah. it, it's out in paperback now, and that's really good. It's a, it's a based on true story about uh, young black men being taken away from their families and put in basically work schools, uh, you know, in Florida. And it's really stunning. Um, another one that I w wanted to mention, I was thinking about during Juneteenth, um, when, you know, the uh, Union generals are going around under the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing slaves all over the place. And um, where do the slaves go? And there's a book that was written maybe 20 years ago, but I, I saw it actually uh, online in Amazon uh, today. It's called The March. And it's by E.L. Doctorow, who you might remember from Ragtime if you're an older person. Um, and it's about Sherman's March to the Sea. And as Sherman is marching to the sea, you know, you've seen him burn Atlanta and Gone with the Wind and stuff. As he's marching to the sea, down to the Sea Islands of Georgia, and South Carolina, where they're giving away the, the, you know, the old plantations to the, you know, the blacks. He is drawing behind him massive numbers of freed blacks who really don't know where to go. So they're following this Union Army in a tremendous, and it's, 
you know, it's a fictional book, but it's based on a true story and it's really excellent. The, uh, the main characters are, are free blacks who are following Sherman's army, the march to the mm -hmm. sea. So that's, that's uh, another recommendation that's tied in with Juneteenth. Awesome. So um, we have another question, question from Michelle. Um, she wrote, can you talk about the movement that happened here in, uh, in the state and what was our influence? That's really <laughs> <laughs> well. I, I think uh, what you have is uh, I, I mentioned Joseph, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. So you do have a, a group of uh, there's Mariah Baldwin. Um, so you do have a group of, of, of women and men um, who are educated, and you know, you have your Harvard first. So you do have like a a, a, a literary uh, or literate African American community, and I do want to mention what what Atlanta was to African Americans during the 1970s and 80s. That's what Boston was to former slaves during the 1840s and 50s. So Boston was kind of a mecca, you know, and uh, and so you know the first black community was where currently the North End is. So the, the, that's in the, in the 1630s, 1640s and 50s when the, some of the, the first African-American 1637, you know, that came here as slaves, but that's, that was the community. Then they moved to what we call the Northern Slope of Beacon Hill. So that where the uh, Museum of African-American History is. And then they moved to the South End and then Roxbury, Dorchester and beyond. But I mean, you, you had a group of citizens of color who were constantly, they were educated, um, and who constantly pushed the envelope for school desegregation in the 1850s, you know. Uh, and so uh, one of the books, the, the Black Bostonians by um, Dr. Horton, uh, you know, you, so you do have a situation where the, 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 the caller was uh, asking, what were what was happening in Massachusetts? We became a beacon. We became a beacon for all those rights. Now we did have the case of uh, uh, George Sims and others, fugitive slaves who actually were returned um, to the South. But uh, one of the things that happened in New Bedford, as New Bedford will, will the historical society will tell you, they refused. New Bedford had uh, uh, they would ring a bell and they never sent a former slave back to the South, as was the case in Boston, you know. So, you know, here locally, and you had, you had, uh, you did have uh, abolitionists. Now, the difference, we had radical, we had abolitionists who believed that, uh, that Blacks should not be enslaved. But then the radical abolitionists believed that not only should Blacks not be enslaved, but they should have the same rights as whites. And those are the, and, and the radical Republicans were a part of that, you know, we talk about William Morrison's. So the, there was a, a situation here in Massachusetts where uh, the, because of the, the, the social climate, it was more amenable to some of the things that we talked about. Not that it was all peace and, and cream and, and, you know, and strawberries, but, but there was a, a degree of freedom that wasn't existent in other cities. Great. Um, okay, so um, there's a question from uh, Martha. She um, asked, do you know anything about absentee ballots and are they actually counted? Uh, that's Stephen's territory. Well, it's funny today, uh, no, yesterday in the mail, and uh, everybody in Massachusetts is going to get it, the possibility of getting a mail-in ballot. You're asked if you want one of those. You know, um, the question about, you know, whether they're counted, huh, all of, you know, in the United States, all of the uh, uh, voting uh, units are very local. So in Abington, they count Abington, and, you know, that's and in Brockton, they count Brockton, and other places do they count everything and there's really you know do you have monitors everywhere uh i know the democratic party has masses of lawyers 
going and preparing to do challenges in sort of dicey places in the South. But, you know, are they, are they counted? Uh, for, you, you might be aware that uh, uh, black man, Jared Bowman, Bowman I think it was Jarrell Bowman, beat Elliot Engel. Uh, it was announced uh, last night. This is in a house, in the primary, in a house race in New York. Elliot Engel is an old man, older than me, even he's like 79 or something. And he has been the congressman, and he's a liberal congressman. But this is uh, a young black man who's a, a, a school administrator uh, in, in Queens, I think, who challenged him in the primary and won. Now, that primary was held in July, about three weeks ago. I mean, in June, June 24th. That's about three weeks ago. And it was just announced, the counting done in New York yesterday. So there's a tremendous fear that with mail-in balloting and absentee balloting and, and uh, you know, uh, early, you know, how we can go here for five days in August before the primary and vote up in Westgate Mall. And then the day of, that this, this uh, sort of spreading out of the voting is an opportunity for purposeful miscounting taking place and chance for this. So uh, with this COVID thing, it increases the danger. So, you know, whether they're counted literally depends on the local <laughs> election officials, period. I don't know if that's very satisfactory. <laughs> Probably makes you feel bad. Sorry to say that. <laughs> um, so the next question is from Deidre. Um, she wrote, can people who were incarcerated vote? If so, what are the procedures? Again, I, I, it's, it's state by state. So, you know, and, and um, some states feel that once you've served your time and, uh, in, and you're released, you can vote. And others are saying, it depending on the crime, so it's a patch quilt of work, you know, that you still can, you can be incarcerated and you can still vote. So again, and you'll, you'll see that the Southern states take a different view. And this view, I mentioned it earlier, goes back to Jim Crow. And what, uh, and what Steve said about the vagrancy laws, it's so true. Every time you see a movie or a film, you know, I remember um, George Clooney was in one, you know, where he was in, uh, in the, he was on a chain game and so forth. But every time, and, and Eddie Murphy, you know, when you see a film like that, just remember that a lot of those men were innocent. And they were, because they couldn't get a job, or they could have had a job, but they, the people felt they were too uppity, or they might cause trouble. And a lot of uh, the research is, is still scanty, but a lot of the former soldiers that came back from World War I, there was that feeling they were so uppity. And so, you know, if, if you know, somebody could say, oh, he did such and such, and he could be arrested, you know. So, you know, again, those laws, you know, so it, it really varies state by state. Now, here in Massachusetts, we do, our, our government, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts says that once you serve your time, you can, and you're released, you can vote. And also, as I understand it, there's a clause where some prisoners actually who are still incarcerated here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts can vote. And I believe also in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But Steve has a better grip on those things. Yeah, I mean, real specifically, we can talk about Florida today because of that Supreme Court decision this week upholding Florida's law. In Florida, it always was that if you committed a felony, this is until last year, if you committed a felony, you were had a lifetime uh, disability, you could not ever vote in the state of Florida again. If you ever wanted to vote, you had to move to another state where they had restitution, uh, where they would, you could apply to have your civil rights restored. Two years ago in Florida, in a referendum called the Amendment 4, by 65%, the people of Florida said that they wanted to withdraw that, that they wanted to be able to restore 
the felons, uh, allow felons to have their rights to vote and other civil rights restored once they had completed their felony sentence, um, except for murder and violent sexual assault, because people, you know, found that a, a bridge too far. In Florida, in order to incarcerate mostly, mostly the Florida prisons are just vastly filled with African American men. Um, if you had a small drug charge, it was a, a felony. So you'd be put in prison for a long sentence, and then when you got out, you could never vote again if you wanted to live in Florida. So they changed this two years ago. So what does Ron DeSantis, the governor, you know, who's the ally of Trump, he gets the Florida state legislature to say, okay, you can have those voting rights, but you, you haven't completed all of your obligations until you pay off your restitution and fines, which can be thousands of dollars. And these are men who have been in prison for long sentences. They were probably poor in the first place and they get out and they're supposed to come up with three grand or something like that to be able to pay that off to get their, their votes restored. Now, this is clearly just like a grandfather clause, a modern day grandfather clause, right, put on by the state. So it's brought to the Supreme Court and John, uh, John Paul, the uh, John Roberts Court says what? That's perfectly fine because those people are not being discriminated against because of their color. It's because they haven't paid back this money. And of course, activists um, involved in the civil rights movement today are saying this is a, they are essentially being disenfranchised because they're poor. That's why, because they're poor. They don't have this money to be able, but and it seems to be a violation of the poll tax. But the Supreme Court, which is no friend of, of minority peoples in the United States, whether they're Mexican or African-American uh, or Indians, um, is, is saying, nah, that's OK. So this is not much different than the situation in 1856 in the U.S. versus Reese where they say, oh, well, uh, you know, grandfather clause isn't really eliminated by the 15th Amendment. So this yeah. is real today. Oh. Oh. We have one last question and we have to keep it very short because we have a time of uh, 6.30 to end. So we need to start wrapping up. So, um, and then I'll briefly go over the other comments that were made, but this is the last question um, from Jacqueline. She wrote, I too received the voting application. There are a number of candidates and have and have to run as a write-in sticker campaign. Um, there is nothing for the primary and for November 3rd for absentee voting and vote by mail application. How does this relate to the past and present? We the people vote by mail, we the people vote by mail vote count and suppressing the vote. Well, what she got, by the way, was an application mm -hmm. to apply for an absentee ballot. Um, and then you had to mark whether you wanted it for the primary or the general election. And if you mark for the primary, you had to indicate a party. If you didn't indicate a party, they wouldn't give you one because it's the primary election. So that thing that, that we're all getting in the mail, this if you haven't got it, you'll get it this week. Every single person with a mailing address, that isn't the, that's an application for an absentee ballot. Uh, so I find this very confusing. I mean, myself, um, I plan to vote in person on September 1st at the Kennedy School. But what if I get sick the week before, right? Uh, how do I vote? You know, I can't, I, and if I apply for the absentee ballot, then, uh, and I send that in, or if I don't send it in, I may not be able to vote when I show up live. I, I do think it, it isn't really clear, even in the document that I got in the mail. So that's not much of a help. <laughs> my, my thing is vote in person. We have early voting in all sorts of sites. You got five days there of early voting. You can also, at least in the past, you've been allowed to go right to Rockton City Hall. 
in advance. My wife voted last night at Rockland City Hall. She just wanted the experience. I voted once at, at Westgate Mall. I didn't enjoy it. Um, and you can vote. So I'm sorry, that doesn't really answer. It's a really confused thing. If you can vote in person, do it. You know, if you're going to be out of state, you know you're going to be out of state for that whole period. It's, it's five days before the September 1st, uh, five weekdays in August is early in-person voting all over the state. Yeah, I, I like that idea of, of uh, early voting and I do do that. Uh, I've taken advantage of that. that I like that idea because a lot of people, I know my wife likes to vote in person, um, but that kind of helps you if you're ill. So if you're ill during early voting, then just go to regular vote. But what I like about early voting, you don't have the lines and the, and you know, and, and I, and I, my heart goes out to those in Georgia who, you know, you, if you look at those districts where people were in line for four and six and eight hours, and you'll see that it's minority districts and that person has not been fired yet, you know? And so like, again, this is voter, all these things, by the way, myself and Steve will not be the host for the program that you're coming up. Jessica will probably, and, and Courtney will probably mention, but on the voter suppression, this show was to give you the historical roots of where those lie. And, uh, but that voter suppression is still going on today, not here in Massachusetts, but in other, other states. And I want to say this, you know, um, I, I, you know, I love teaching. I still do it. But, you know, friends of mine in the South, just as an example, in our uh, free frameworks, it says uh, Civil War and Reconstruction. In the South, this is 2021. And it, and it says the War of Northern Aggression. So when you look at the curriculums for Florida and, and South Carolina and North Carolina, they don't even say the Civil War. They say the war of northern aggression today, 21st century. So, you know, there are regional differences, very, very real regional differences. And that accounts for the whole idea with the masks and so forth. And, uh, and so it's just, this is, this is I, I agree, like with, with uh, Vice, uh, um, former Vice President Biden said, it's for the soul of America. It's the soul of America. And although I want to say this, I don't like to get political, but all those people who voted for Trump, when you voted for him, you a lot of the racism and vitriol that we have, all those Republicans, and I have good friends that are Republicans, you know, that that's part and parcel, you know, because that's what he stands for. Thank you. Um, Leona, I will get those books to you and I can send the books along to anyone else who wanted to read it, but I will hand it back to Jessica so that we can close out um, and so she can provide more information for the next webinar. I'll mute myself. So I want to be mindful of the time. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to thank our panelists, Willie and Steve. It was great. Brockton, NAACP, Phyllis, thank you for being with us. Um, and this is just the beginning of the conversation. So this is going to be a series. Um, as was mentioned, the next part of the series is going to be threats to voting rights. So I'm sure that's going to be a very interesting one. Um, so be on the lookout for that registration information. Um, you can find it on our social media pages and on our website. Um, and then some future sessions will just cover topics such as local representation, uh, take some looks at the ballot questions, and hopefully have some town halls with candidates. So. Uh, we hope that you'll join us. If you're a member of any organization or you know of any organizations who would like to partner with us on this series, please just give them our contact information and we will connect with them. Um, any closing words for the panelists? I do want to say thank you guys for the books. I was writing down all of the names and maybe after this we can send out kind of like a book list uh, for people to read. But any closing words that anyone has? Me, thank um, you. I, I, would, I was oh. thinking it was very informative. Thank you, yeah. Steve. Thank you, Willie. You really know your stuff. The people, if you're not registered, please register and get out the vote. Thank you. Uh, thank just you. To, 
I'd like to, I, I just want to thank Jessica for running this so well. As you know, I was kind of nervous about this, and Courtney knows I was nervous. Thank you very much, Courtney. You've been a gracious host, Jessica. And it's always lovely to see Phyllis. You know, now it's not real life anymore, so I don't see her in the flesh. And it's good to see Willie. I'm glad you have Republican friends. <laughs> anyway. Awesome. Well, thank you. I, I hope everyone found this to be educational. I know time is a very valuable thing. So I just want to thank everybody who is on for spending the past 90 minutes with us. It goes by fast, actually. Um, but as you're going out today, just enjoy the weather, stay hydrated, and remember to wear your mask. COVID is still a thing. <laughs> so thank you all and check our social media for the next sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank night. You.